We're over 55 hours into Marvel's fourth phase, and with six films and dozens of episodes for various shows, there's a lot to watch. With the release of Thor Love and Thunder, now is a great time to take a look back. I'm Chris Goodmakers, and it's time to talk about the tiny details and hidden moments that snuck by. Spoilers ahead for all of Phase 4, including Thor Love and Thunder and Miss Marvel. Let's talk about the charming city of Tonsberg in Norway. It's the single oldest city in Norway, founded by Vikings in the 5th century. They did have a little help from Odin though. This is the village we see attacked by ice giants in the first Thor film. It appears again in Phase 1 when Red Skull steals the cosmic cube from Argus Filch. The Asgardians must have called in some favors because as of Endgame, Tonsberg has been renamed to New Asgard. Yes, the city they saved long ago is now the new home of the Asgardians. It's also the location where Odin turned into magic dust and the shards of Molnir fell. Tonsberg sees a lot of change by the time of Love and Thunder, but it's still just as charming as ever. Minus the ice giants and shadow monsters. During the opening battle of Love and Thunder, Thor is demonstrating just how OP he has become on a bunch of owl men. He blows up several vehicles and hover bikes belonging to the bird boys, one of which is a familiar looking vehicle that Thor sends for a tumble. You get it? Because it's the tumbler. Thor destroyed a bright pink version of Christian Bale's old ride from his days as the caped crusader. The vehicle in Thor is larger and pink, but has the same four back wheels and the same cockpit looking front. Thor can destroy the tumbler, but keep him away from Keaton's ride. When Jane is undergoing treatment, she talks to another patient about how to comprehend an Einstein Rosenbridge. She cites two movies that both use the same example and then demonstrates it. This is the famous paper analogy used in both Event Horizon and Interstellar. The existence of both these movies in the MCU raises a ton of questions, especially since they cross over into the reality of Love and Thunder. Event Horizon, the cult horror film from the mid-90s, stars Sam Neill. Sam Neill is a storied actor who is mostly famous for Jurassic Park and not Possession, because there isn't any justice in this world. He's also the actor portraying Odin in the Asgard Players Troupe. I think this character is an Asgardian thespian and not actually Sam Neill playing himself, so Jane can be forgiven for not asking him to autograph her VHS copy of In the Mouth of Madness like I would. Interstellar is also a fun wrinkle because of its director. Interstellar is directed by Christopher Nolan, the same Christopher Nolan who directed the Bale Batman trilogy. In the MCU, did Nolan still make the Batman movies? Did the people of the MCU see them and think, wow, these movies aren't realistic because the Joker doesn't have a giant sky beam. Let's leave Thor behind and revisit the world of the Eternals. Wait, 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 don't turn off the video. I talk about the Evil Dead later, I promise. In the premiere entry for the ancient super team, we learn that the Eternals have been influencing humanity since its earliest days, helping guide the world along a path that would maximize the amount of life on the planet. Except after about 4,000 years or so, they called it quits and decided to bum around the earth for a while. Cersei takes up a job teaching. On the way to her class, she passes a statue of Charles Darwin. It's ironic because Darwin's theories on natural selection are the very theories that the Eternals sort of negate. It's not entirely negated as these weird robots didn't design Galapagos turtles. Just the atom bomb, I guess. It's more of a comment on how the Eternals are different from those around them. Humans evolved, but the Eternals were built. One more detail about the Eternals before we move on to greener pastures and away from this sad volcano beach of a film. When we flash back to the Eternals hanging out in the ancient city of Babylon, they're chilling in a nice garden. In fact, this may be the nicest garden in human history as it's one of the fabled seven wonders of the world. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon are the most elusive when it comes to historical record. Some historians even doubt they existed at all, but they won't answer my letters about if the Eternals were actually real, so screw what they think! And that is the most I ever want to think about the Eternals again. Unfortunately, I'm working on a video about post credit scenes, and there is that giant dangling thread called Harry Styles. Let's talk about some of the implications of the snap and who was and wasn't turned to dust. Katie and Sean have a favorite way to blow off some steam 
and it's some hardcore full body karaoke. While they aren't going full Retsuko with heavy metal, they still have some banger song choices. One of which is Old Town Road by Lil Nas X. The thing is, Old Town Road was released in 2019, a year after the snap. So Lil Nas X was spared from the horrific galactic culling and chose to process this global crisis by recording this hip hop country mashup. Did he still release dozens of remixes? Furthermore, did his MCU career continue along the same path and he released Montero? Only it was Thanos' lap he was dancing in. One could hope. Sean, aka Shang-Chi, runs into trouble on a city bus and ends up dodging a knife-armed man named... Uh... Razor Fist. Anyway, while Shang-Chi is being assaulted by both a giant sword and a stunning lack of originality, he is being recorded by a fellow passenger. The man providing a play-by-play -play of the whole fight is played by actor Zack Cherry. This isn't his first time in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He also appeared around the wall crawler. Cherry was in Spider-Man Homecoming as a hot dog vendor who screams to Peter to do a flip. It's not entirely clear if this is the same character, but they are the same actor with the same beard, so I guess he moved to San Francisco in the intervening years. Huh, I wonder if real estate prices in California took a nosedive when half the state turned to dust. Maybe Thanos was right after all. Hopefully Cherry returns at some point, because since this role he has gone on to the acclaimed new series, Severance. I rarely get the opportunity to recommend something on this channel, but I'm sneaking it in here. Go watch Severance, folks. It's amazing. We finally learned what happened in Budapest, and it turns out that Clint and Natasha do remember it very differently. For Natasha, it was a white-knuckle escape involving dodging counter-agents and local authorities. For Clint, it was the time they hid in an air duct for a few days with nothing to do. There's a small hint to this with the word boredom forming under an impromptu game of Hangman. It was obviously Clint's word, and it looks like he got the best of Natasha because the man is hanged, and the word is incomplete. Point Barton. I promised it, so let's talk about the bloody, low budget, and absolutely groundbreaking film, The Evil Dead. The first film from director Sam Raimi, it was made with what amounts to pocket change today. Since then, Raimi has gone on to do much larger budget films like the Spider-Man trilogy and um, that, that Wizard of Oz prequel, I guess. His most recent film is his return to the world of superheroes with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. However, this movie has more in common with his horror roots than it does with his Spider-Man films. There are a few small nods to the Evil Dead trilogy in the actions of the Scarlet Witch. When Wanda is trapped in the mirror plane, she reaches her hand through into a mirror like it's a pool of water. This is how she turns the reflections against Strange and Wong. It's a recreation of the shot where Ash Williams places his hand in the mirror. In the sequel, the mirror holds an evil doppelganger of Ash that lunges out in much the same way Wanda does when she escapes. There's also Raimi's love of a good old-fashioned evil hag. Since he could apply makeup, he's been using it to turn all of his most beautiful actresses into horrendous demon ladies. And Wanda is no exception. While she retains her normal face for most of the film, she has a brief transformation when she decapitates poor Professor X. Yeah, that wasn't just an X snap. She ripped his head off like he was a Twilight vampire. This jump scare is echoed several times throughout Raimi's work. It happens in all three Evil Dead films, including its absolute best use in Raimi's greatest film, Army of Darkness. Yo, she bitch. Let's go. Natasha and Yelena may not be blood related, but they are sisters in every way that matters. They share a lot in common, including two very terrible parents who are actually deep cover Soviet spies. Their air quotes father is the Russian super soldier, the Red Guardian. He spent the last decade or so in a Russian gulag, so he's been a little absentee for the two sisters. That doesn't mean he hasn't kept them in his heart and his shoulder. A prison tattoo on Alexei's arm features a pair of roses and two names in Russian Cyrillic. It's Natasha and Yelena's names. 
Aw, that's nice. Hey, you know Thanos? He's the eight foot tall being of pure power whose singular goal is the annihilation of half the life in the universe. He also owns a bright yellow helicopter with his name on the side. The Thanos Copter, as it's known, is a vehicle the villain used to tool around in in the comics. While his MCU counterpart forgoes the helicopter, he replaces it with a large blade that he spins like one. The helicopter does make an actual appearance, however, abandoned in the timeless void. While we're on the subject of Loki, how about we talk about the time Thor was a frog? Frog Thor is an oddity when it comes to the lore of Thor. Thor's lore! There's a shot of him stuck in a jar with the words T365 written on the top. It's a reference to Thor issue 365, in which Throg, as he is known, first appeared. Hopefully we get more of this slippery Avenger, if only to hear a frog use some grandiose language like ye. How about some heroes and the hidden references to their creators? For a long time, the men and women who crafted these characters have not received as much credit as they deserve. While Stanley was soaking up all the cameo attention, other creators had to settle for their names on a wall. The first one of Phase 4 to highlight is Ditko graffitied on a wall behind Peter and MJ. Steve Ditko is Spider-Man's co-creator and arguably had much more influence on the character than Stan Lee did. He's not the only creator to end up memorialized in name. Miss Marvel also pays tribute to the young heroes creators with both a school dedication plaque and a wall mural of Ant-Man. The plaque features the names of both G. Willow Wilson and Adrian Alfona. My sincerest apologies to Adrian Alfona for constantly using this Wikipedia photo to talk about him. Both writer and artist crafted Kamala Khan in her debut run of comics. Alfona also gets another shout out with his name also on a wall mural in Karachi. So I guess in this universe, this street artist also helped found a school in New Jersey? G. Willow Wilson does end up with a little more representation in the series, as she has a whole character named after her with the school guidance counselor. Plus, she even gets a quick cameo in the end. Staying with the recently completed series, Miss Marvel left some viewers with some big questions at the end of the show. Out of all of those, the biggest and most important was also the show's biggest unresolved plotline. Who was the Mosque Shoe Thief? Well, it turns out the show did answer this question, and in the very same episode. When Nakia complains that her shoes are missing, she says they were her brand new Versace's. Multiple pairs have gone missing, and given it's from the ladies' lockers, there's an unsavory connotation too. Well, actually, it's much simpler than that, and one quick shot shows the culprit. The young boy who falls out of the minaret is wearing a brand new pair of Versace shoes. Yes, he was the shoe thief all along. I guess Kamala shouldn't feel that bad about breaking the kid's arm. Now it'll be harder for him to steal stuff. He seems cool with it anyway, judging by his end scene, and that one frame of the Miss Marvel titles is a cast with her name written on it. We have yet to talk about the biggest and best film of Phase 4 so far. The one that changed the world of Marvel forever. Morbius is the now legendary film that earned billions of dollars at the box office in what is now referred to as the Morbius Sweep. Its final post credit scene changed the game entirely, but fans were so aghast at the idea of the Vulture and Morbius teaming up that they missed this subtle detail. After the Vulture utters the now iconic line, I think a bunch of guys like us should team up and do some good. There's a small audio cue right at the end of the line. This barely audible beeping is actually the dial tone of the phone line. This is because as soon as Michael Keaton finishes his lines, he abruptly hung up on the phone he was calling in on. The old tape recorder being used to capture his performance actually caught the lost connection tone. Most fans in the theater didn't notice because they were too busy high-fiving and chest bumping. At least I know I was. Every show and film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe features hundreds of hours of hard work from some of the industry's leading craftspeople. These tiny details and moments exist because the people working on these features obsess over every detail in every frame. Subtle little jokes and nods are a way to both pay homage to what came before and to expand the universe of Marvel in subtle ways. There's still a lot to come in Phase 4, 
so I'm sure I'll revisit this topic in a future video. In the meantime, keep a keen eye out, viewer. Maybe Puck will make a background appearance in She-Hulk.